Namane Patris et Filii et Spiritus Sancti. Amen. Ave Maria, gratia plena Dominus Tecum, benedicta tu in mulieribus, et benedictus fructus ventris tui, Iesus. Sancta Maria, Mater Dei, ora pro nobis peccatoribus, nunc et in hora mortis nostre. Amen. Namane Patris et Filii et Spiritus Sancti. Amen. Hello, my dear unknown friends, and welcome back to the channel. I'm Ignotus Amicus. I wanted to spend this video in response to a question that I received on one of my earlier videos. The previous video, um, I'll put it in the, probably put a card in the corner, whichever corner it is. And, um, so that you can go back and watch the video in question. It was one of my attempts to explain Tomberg and his conception of sacred magic or Catholic magic, what I have now come to refer to as Sophiergy, the work of wisdom. Um, and uh, funny enough, I believe that that previous video was in response to another viewer's question that they had on a previous video before that. Um, so let me pull up the question. And the question is from, uh, I'm not sure how to pronounce the username, but it's... Uh, T, uh, it's what, Trulof, uh, T-R-L-O-U-G-H. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing it correctly. But they ask, why is Tomberg fixated on referring to this as magic rather than grace or miracles? What would the practice of sacred magic look like? Just the ordinary practice of Catholicism? I don't understand when he says that the scriptures are magical formulas. What am I missing here? I would like to, first of all, thank this individual for asking this question. I just happened to, I just happened to go into my account uh, the other day, and I have a number of YouTube accounts that I use to sort of silo the algorithm to suit my purposes. You know, I have one that I want that I use for watching uh, sort of the day-to-day -day news and podcasts, and then I have another dedicated to music, and then of course this one dedicated to matters of uh, faith and spirituality. I wanted to, um, and so I was just checking to see what had changed since it had been a few months since my last login. And first and foremost, I would like to thank everybody who has subscribed to this channel. Uh, I believe I'm sitting now at 265 subscribers as of the recording of this video. And... If you enjoy this rambling content, and it is rambling, then please uh, like, share, and subscribe. And make sure you have the bell notification toggled on so that anytime I upload, you will be notified. Um, but I'm, I'm very grateful for all of you who have taken time out of your day to watch or listen to in the background my videos. I noticed that one of my top performing videos has been one about, uh, well, it's more of a, a reading of selected passages from St. Hildegard von Bingen's Physica, which was her work on 
medicinal remedies using various uh, natural means. And I focused on herbs and stones because I... <laughs> uh, subtly, I wanted to trigger all of the, um, all all of the prideful uh, trad Catholics out there, um, and all of the evangelicals and other fundy prots. Um, but more so because I wanted to take the opportunity to illustrate there that there's within orthodox catholicism a means of performing what could be referred to equivalently as sympathetic magic and in the case of the remedies prescribed by St. Hildegard, they would fall under the first category of magic via Tomberg's interpretation or conception, being that there's three, uh, that there are three types of magic. Just as a brief review, we have sacred or divine magic, we have personal magic, and then we have sorcery. And the things that distinguish these three forms of magic from each other can, uh, can easily be discerned through applying Crowley's theory or Crowley's um, definition of magic being the art and science of causing change in accordance to will. So for Tomberg, it's a question of whose will in divine or sacred magic it's god's will be done in personal magic it's my will be done and in sorcery it is some unknown entities will be done that you don't fully understand nor can you ever truly understand because it naturally will deceive you into thinking uh, thinking something of it that it is not. In other words, um, doing the bidding of the di of uh, the diabola. So we can use this to, uh, I guess, segue back to the question: Why, uh, why does Tomberg fixate on the definition of magic as opposed to grace or miracles? And I'm not going to sit here and say that I am an expert on Tomberg. I am a perpetual student of Tomberg. And I would argue that anybody who studies Tomberg is only ever a student of Tomberg. I don't think that there's any mastering Tomberg. Uh, because every time I read and reread passages, it's like an onion. There's all. There's just layers upon layers upon layers of depth, and each reread opens up a completely new. Uh, it polishes a new facet on the jewel, as it were. Um, and it, and it's a, and we'll say that the jewel is a perfect sphere, so it has an infinite number of facets, basically. Um. So, when I answer this question, understand that it is coming from an armchair amateur who likes to spend his free time reading deep subjects, be it philosophy, spirituality, um, uh, faith and morals, Dog, uh, dogmatics, catechisms, apologetics, all kinds of stuff. I have taken some time to break it up a little bit and have introduced some literature, some fiction, um, whether it's 
literary fiction, science fiction, or fantasy. Uh, but I'm trying to cultivate higher qualities of those things in order to be, in order to maintain um, uh, a level of uh, gratuitousness towards my soul. Just trying to keep the soul fed, keep the mind thinking and contemplating, regardless of what I'm reading. Anyhow, apologies for the tangent. So, as I can understand currently, when Tom Berg uses the word magic, one of the first things he does in the third letter on the Empress is he provides us a one-liner definition from an individual named Pappas. I've only done so much digging on the individual known as Pappas, and from what I understand, he was involved in some esoteric circles in France in the 19th century, as, as was popular during those days. But in Pappas's case, it seems that he that he did his best to remain orthodox to the Catholic faith. There's an account where he was attending mass and the priest gave a sermon that miracles are done. Miracles are over. Um, the mir miracles ended with the age of uh, uh, miracles ended at the aid, the end of the apostolic era. Um, whether he means with the death of the apostles or the death of the successor, the, the immediate successors of the apostles, I'm not sure where this priest delineates the end of the apostolic era. Mainly because the Technically, the apostolic era doesn't actually end, at least in my opinion, so long as there are apostolic successors, which there are in the Catholic and Orthodox churches. That's neither here nor there. So, after this sermon, after Mass, Pappas approaches this priest and pushes him on his assumptions. And the priest doubles down and is like, yes, there are no miracles. There are no more miracles. And as the account goes, a suddenly a bolt of lightning came through the window into the sacristy, I believe it was, and struck the floor in f uh, between the priest and Pappas. And Pappas, is, uh, Pappas basically just kind of did the whole like, you know, raised his eyebrows and silently was like, you sure about that? Um, and one of the reasons I like this account is, one, it establishes that Pappas attended Mass and seemed to at least be making an effort to remain Catholic, despite his esoteric leanings. And with... Um, and so, Tom Berg, in the third letter, offers us a definition of magic from Pappas. And let me go ahead and uh, pull that up real quick. I have it right here. Let's see. Magic, according to Pappas, is the science of love. And then he follows it up with uh, more of an academic definition. Again, from Pappas, the uh, magic is the application of the strengthened human will to accelerate the evolution of the living forces of nature. So what does this mean? Um, why is it that Tomberg goes for this definition as opposed to 
Crowley's definition, which was very popular at the time that Tomberg would have been writing meditations on the tarot. I believe that Tomberg goes with these two definitions of magic early on in within the first two pages or within between the second and third page of the third letter. I believe the reason is because he's attempting to illustrate that as it concerns sacred magic, that ultimately it is an act of love, or that it at least should be. And then, of course, the question is, what is it that one loves? If you love God, then you're, you're um, the source of uh, the source of that power is bestowed to you, should God will it. In personal magic, the uh, let me pardon me, let me pull that up again. The strengthened human will is applied to himself. And then in the third case of sorcery, the strengthened human will is directed towards the ends of forces that the practitioner does not understand nor cares to understand so long as it benefits themselves. And as we know, that never really ends well for people. So, all right, why the fixation on using the word magic as opposed to miracles or grace? Well, later on in the letter, we are given the passage from the book of Acts. Let me pull it up. So it's from Acts chapter 9, verses 32 to 34. Quote, Now as Peter went here and there among them all, he came down also to the saints that lived in Lydda, or Lydda, depending on who, which pronunciation you go by. There he found a man named Aeneas, or Aeneas, who had been bedridden for eight years and was paralyzed. And Peter said to him, Aeneas, Jesus Christ heals you. Rise and make your bed. And immediately he rose, he being Aeneas. So that's the next source material that Tomberg presents us in the letter, right after he gives us Pappas's two definitions. So in this account, we have Peter performing a miracle. Why was he able to perform the miracle? Because he had been granted the graces necessary to do so. The grace of, you know, uh, sanctifying grace, being in this, you know, he, he was in a state of grace. Sanctifying, actual, and whatever other type of grace that Peter had available to him at that time that he performed this miracle. Later, as the letter progresses, Tomberg kind of unpacks this episode in the book of Acts to, uh, to further elaborate on why he is fixating on this definition of magic from Pappas. And ultimately, we're given this sort of exegesis on what it means to perform a miracle and how exactly one performs a miracle. 
and of course there's you have to have there grace is a component of it grace isn't the only like grace isn't the same as the act of performing the miracle although the miracle requires grace and so to answer the viewer's question why tomberg's fixation on using the word magic it's because it's it is a useful word to describe the act of performing a miracle that incorporates the understanding that grace is present also understand with this definition of magic and as Tomberg unpacks it what he's also doing is he's showing us that as he understands it this magic he goes on about is a moment where an an individual who has become an instrument of God who has who has achieved concentration without effort on God's will which Tomberg talks about in the first letter uh, when he talks of the magician and this once you once this individual achieves concentration without effort on the highest thing of all God that they then are able to know where and when God wishes them to act and who to act upon and it's this meeting of the vertical and the horizontal that Tomberg also goes on about the horizontal being the more corporeal material reality and the vertical being the unseen reality a miracle is where the cross <laughs> dramatic pause a miracle is a point where the vertical and the horizontal meet in perfect harmony for the right reason and as long as the vertical is directly connected to the source of all being then therefore your action at that moment is sacred or divine magic as tomberg puts it or as i like to uh, as i'm attempting to colloquialize if that's a word the term sophiergy a work of wisdom a miracle is a work of wisdom and then of course why why would i say that it's a work that a, a miracle is a work of wisdom because oftentimes when a miracle occurs someone is often non-verbally imparting understanding to the recipient i was listening to an episode of the european conservatives symposia where it, they were interviewing a i believe a trappist benedictine monk or a trappist monk in the netherlands i could be incorrect it's a gentleman who recently wrote a book about chastity and there was a discussion about saint mary of egypt and they brought up an episode in the life of this saint where after her years of debauchery she went on um she ended up in jerusalem during the feast of the exaltation of the holy cross and wanted to enter the church where the relic was being held 
and she attempted to go through the doors, but was sort of held at bay by an invisible wall. In this instance, um, there certainly is something miraculous occurring, but it's not occurring by anyone's hand. She was almost, uh, St. Mary of Egypt was almost being uh, held back by possibly an angel or by Christ's own hand. And she sort of makes a confession or, um, or makes a concerted intention to confess and to return to a state of grace. And as soon as she makes it, she is allowed in. In this instance, we would not call that magic by Tom Berg's conception, because there isn't a meeting of two. There's, there isn't one person who is praying or performing some sort of action in order to, well, I mean, for all we know, there might have been someone praying very hard for St. Mary of Egypt, for all we know. Maybe someone in her family was praying very, very hard and doing all kinds of penances in order to have St. Mary mend her ways. So, scratch everything I just said <laughs> about there not being a another participant in this miracle. Um, it could very well have been someone had prayed and that God was answering the pra those prayers. But in any case, the especially in the instance of Peter healing Aeneas, we see what Tomberg means by magic is the art of love or the, yeah, uh, the, the art of love. Forgive me. The science of love. <coughs> and, and in this instance, it's God's will that is occurring. If Peter hadn't gone up to Aeneas, to tell him that Jesus heals him. You know, Peter could have just walked up and looked at the guy. If he had just looked at the guy and not said anything, would the miracle have occurred? Mm, no, I don't believe so. There's a reason. There's a reason why Peter had to speak, right? Because Jesus Christ is the Word, the Logos. The Logos had to be made manifest. And in order to do so, Peter had to speak. There had to be breath. There's a lot of, <clears throat> for lack of a better word, energy in breath. I think that we take the archetype <clears throat> of breath um, for granted. We take it for granted. We take its symbolism for granted. And we don't contemplate that symbolism enough. To speak is incredibly powerful. And I know many Christians, especially conservative Christians, despise hearing that but I hate to break it to you. Uh, words are palpable. They truly are. And why is that? It's because it words have the power to move the spirit. 
and and of course sometimes not speaking at all has its own detriments as well the whole silence is violence sort of thing but with that being said um, there's no doubt that words are powerful and there's a reason why gossip is frowned upon there's a reason why um, vain words are uh, frowned upon there's a reason why the um, there's a reason for not taking the Lord's name in vain why waste your breath if you don't have the intention behind it vain talk is talk a without intention and you know in, in the gospels the warning christ gives us about vain repetition well what is vain repetition vain repetition is is in a way superstition because you're placing faith in the words that you're saying and disconnecting your intention from them to a to a degree you're just going through the motions you're not actively participating in speaking the words and this is why uh, when the criticism against the rosary is levied by many of the fundy prot evangelical room temperature folks that they don't understand that for sure the rosary can definitely be said in in um in vain um if you have no intention whatsoever of obtaining any of the graces associated with it and you're just saying it just to say it perhaps there might be a sliver of grace thrown your way i pray but uh there is a difference between just saying the rosary to say the rosary for outward appearances and actively reciting the rosary and actively contemplating huge difference so in order for this miracle in the book of acts to occur peter had to speak and he knew he had to speak uh, because he was attuned to god's will and he was attuned to god's will because he uh, because of love uh, he loved he loved christ so much that after the resurrection after pentecost he was just compelled to do everything he could to follow god's will unto the bitter end and so let's see i hope that um i hope that some of that helps answer the question i'm not sure why it closed out on me let me pull it back up so yes um why so then why why is tomberg fixated on using the word magic because it's a it's a it's a useful it's a useful category it's a useful word to refer to the active uh, the active participation in god's will that results in a miracle to your other question what would the practice of sacred magic look like just the ordinary practice of catholicism well yes <laughs> uh, the short answer is yes of course it is um 
from the liturgy to the divine office to the recolta. I keep a copy of the recolta on my uh, on my little uh, oratory here. Um, uh, you know your novena. You know, take a book of novenas, uh, a no, your novenas, your rosaries, your chaplets, your personal devotions, the sacraments. All of that falls under the category of sacred or divine magic as conceived of by Tomberg. Because um, even if we are not fully able to perceive it, there's... There's miracles happen every day, every second of every day, sometimes in every moment of our life. And we just don't have the eyes to see it, I believe. I believe we really are blind to a lot of the miraculous that occurs around us. And I think that that's what Carl Jung was getting at when he was talking about the, the concept of synchronicity. You know, it's... Uh, he would liken it to like things begin to seem as if they're all connected somehow. Well, to anyone who is a uh, faithful Christian, i.e. A, a Catholic, you're going to see, the the more you participate in the spiritual life of a faithful Catholic, the more you're going to begin to recognize the synchronicities, the little miracles throughout the day. Um, and, uh, and, and that's why we have to make sure that we're giving thanks, um, throughout the day. That that's the purpose of, of prayers of gratitude. They're, they're there, um, so that we acknowledge the graces and the miracles that we've received without even knowing if we've received them, which, you know, requires faith. That's why faith is a virtue. It's why it's the chief of the three theological virtues. So, so yes, um, the practice of sacred magic is your m not milk toast. No, no, not milk toast Catholicism. It is, Catholicism. Catholicism is an act of sacred divine magic. And I know that magic is a, a, a word that is hard to stomach for many faithful Catholics and Christians across all the uh, non-Catholic denominations. And so that's why I tend to use the word sophiergy. Uh, to differentiate it from just run-of-the-mill theurgy that was common with pagans in late antiquity um, and to distinguish it uh, from the other two uh, types of magic you know, magic with a k you know when i when i say sophiergy we're not talking magic with a k we're talking what Tomberg refers to as sacred divine magic. In other words, just Catholicism. Now, does this exclude certain things? Mm, for sh Certainly there are things that one should exclude in their personal practice, for sure. Um, anything involving barbarous names is best to be avoided. Um, as I've often said in my other videos, there are, um, there are truths hidden um, in the brambles. You know, uh, if we go off the, the parable of the sower, you know, he sows it on the, um, in the good soil and he sows it in the in the bad soil where all the thistles grow and choke everything out. Well, the, the, my approach is when you see, when, when you find a seed or a sapling that has started to grow amongst 
the thistles and thorns. Uh, go in and get it. Go in and save it. You know, be a be a good landscaper like Adam and Eve were before the fall. Get in there, save that sapling, save that seed, and bring it to the good soil. Um, and I think that is, uh, I think that is often um, one of the things that falls within what Tom Berg calls Christian hermeticism. Um, it's it's this sort of study of the things that are out there that often um, that we often f see in other traditions, in other religions, in other practices. Um, and one of the focuses of this channel has been sort of to dive in to materials within the genre of occult and esoteric literature in order to find the saplings and the good seeds and take them out of from the thistles and thorns so that they can be put in the good soil um, because as we know the devil uh, uses pieces of the truth in order to deceive and so I think it's very important that um, I think it's very important to, to have a dialectical or a um, or a dio or a a diagolos towards uh, towards rescuing those rescuing those seeds and um, we almost have to have like a platonic dialogue with with those who are mistaken, uh, you know, I'm not suggesting that we just full blown have dialogue with the diabolic. That is not what I'm saying. What I'm, what I'm suggesting is that the approach to any literature from other traditions or religions should be as dialogue with the goal that the truth will be extracted and and rescued and then those who then who have been part of those other traditions can look and see that the thing that they that that the essence of what they were going after all along is in the catholic church and one of the <clears throat> uh, one of the um most well-researched versions of this um, has been as it relates to Our Lady of Guadalupe. And the, <clears throat> the ancient Aztec philosophies that were prominent and all the literature that was uh, the literary tradition present in that culture prior to her apparitions. So, and, and, you know, I, I mentioned this in my video on Catholicism as the true perennial philosophy. Um, in fact, I still I still need to get around to reading the, uh, this book, um, Guadalupe and the Flower World Prophecy. Uh, but the, that is <clears throat> that is an example of exactly what I'm talking about. I believe it can be done with more esoteric and occult literature. Um, that is basically what Tomberg's project was with Meditations on the Tarot. That's the essence of the whole book right there. He's extracting uh, the, the hidden pieces of orthodoxy scattered throughout and bringing the pieces together um, in, in an incredibly beautiful way. So, it, so 
um, to answer the question, what would the practice of sacred magic look like? Yes, it would be basically Catholicism. Um, and it would also look like a faithful Catholic or, you know, a, um, a striving Catholic uh, going out and performing miracles. Um, again, uh, we don't know. We often don't get to see the effects of our prayer. Sometimes we don't get to see the effects of our prayer in our lifetime. But there definitely is, um, it, it definitely is a type of magic. It is a sophiergy, a work of wisdom um, to pray. And in your personal devotions, if, if you, if, if it uh, helps and does not hinder you to trace religious symbols in the air, which you know, the priest does with the sign of the cross multiple times throughout the mass, the sign of the cross is incredibly powerful. More people, people need to understand how potent the sign of the cross really is. Um, you know, um, you know, if you want to do like, you could do something akin to the lesser banishing ritual of the pentagram, which was cooked up by the, uh, hermetic order of the golden dawn folks. And, you know, you can easily, you know, it's in a way it's, uh, some would argue it is a mockery of the Asperges at the beginning of mass. You know, the purpose of the Asperges is to, um, it's like a soft, a soft exorcism of the sanctuary space and of the people at, uh, of the congregation about to attend mass, um, you know, uh, um, invoking protection upon all attending the mass. Uh, and, you know, that's what we do with, we, you know, sprinkle yourself with holy water. You know, you don't have to do any elaborate ritual, but there's nothing preventing you from doing so as long as, as long as you don't become prideful about it. Like if I were to cook up a, uh, a Catholic version of the lesser banishing ritual of the pentagram, uh, the pentagrams would be replaced with signs of the cross. That'd be the first thing to go. Um, you know, in invoking the different names of God, uh, when you, when you actually look at it, the, none of those names of God that are often invoked are, they are not, uh, they're not heretical at all. Um, some of them are just, you know, abbreviations of passages from scripture. So there's nothing wrong with those. Um, you know, uh, and then the, um, some of the, some of the other were prayers that tend to come after many different versions of this. Um, you know, they're, some of them are hodgepodge. Some of them are, uh, more, uh, Talmudic, Tal Talmudic than they are Christian. Um, and then sometimes there's the, our father that has been heavily altered. So, well, let's see what I would do, uh, how, how to make the, um, the lesser banishing ritual Catholic, uh, replace the pentagrams with the signs of the cross, uh, keep the invocations of the names of God. Um, you can invoke the archangels, um, uh, so long as they're archangels that fall within Christian tradition for sure. Um, which thankfully Uriel does. Um, and uh, heck, I would probably, I would probably conclude it with like the, uh, the breastplate of St. Patrick, you know, Christ before me, Christ behind me, Christ above me, Christ below me, Christ within me, Christ without me and so on and so forth. Um, 
So there's another example of um, saving the good seeds from the thistles and thorns. And I, I you know, the Christian hermeticism, um, as far as I can tell, and what I am doing in this channel is basically that, um, you know, reading through the literature that has been translated, found, transcribed, and extracting that which is true from it and returning it within context of uh, um, returning it within the context of Catholicism, uh, within the context of that which is true, good, and beautiful. And let's see. So uh, that could be a, another way in which one would practice Sophiergy or Tomberg's sacred divine magic. If you, um, you know, tracing the sign of the cross, just make the sign of the cross everywhere. Make the sign of the cross on yourself. Make the sign of the cross on public servants like police officers, firefighters, um, and EMTs. You know, if you're driving down, if you're driving on the road and you see the sirens blaring, make the sign of the cross for them towards them as they drive as they drive past you they need that blessing they're going into some they're going into some danger you know they need every grace they can get um you know and because they're civil civil servants they they fall within your jurisdiction in the econ in the economia or in the economy of grace as i understand it let's see and then I don't understand when he says that the scriptures are magical formulas. What am I missing here? Um, so what you are missing could be, um, so the passage from Acts chapter 9 that Tomberg cites at the beginning of the third letter, uh, that is his, that's the example that he unpack he as he's unpacking it he's telling us that this is uh this is how we know that the script that the scriptures are a formula for divine sacred magic um tradition is as well you know we have all the various liturgical traditions that are um approved uh that fall within the purview of quo primum of course um, I'm not here to discuss the Novus Ordo. We'll just leave it at that. Um, but, you know, liturgy falls within tradition, but often the, uh, all of the symbolism within liturgy is derived from scripture. Um, so scripture is a magical formula or a sophiological formula in that way. Um, then you have the means by which miracles are performed, you can clearly see there's a pattern and the pattern is illustrated throughout. Uh, it, the, the pattern repeats itself through the course of scripture. It, in any event that a miracle occurs, there's always, um, there's always the bare minimums that are required for the miracle to, uh, to be affected of course the faith in god trusting in god's will following his will loving god and being willing to act as an instrument uh, to speak what needs to be spoken to perform a to perform a movement that uh, symbolizes your dedication to carrying out God's will. Um, that's what that's what Tomberg means by the uh, by the scriptures being the magical formula, um, the gospels being like a. He he even says, you know, that the scriptures are a grimoire, and it could even be argued that Saint Hildegard von Bingen's Physica is a Catholic grimoire that is sanctioned. Um, I am not aware of the Physica ever having been on the index of forbidden books. So, 
everything in that book is fair game to use. Just, I'm not a doctor, neither are you. Just make sure that you use your common sense and see a doctor if you have something going on. And then when all else fails, by all means, um, just, um, you know, I am not a doctor. You do what you think you are informed enough to do. But just know that the Physica is available to you if you would like to make use of the remedies therein. Um, having read many of them, they don't sound to be harmful in any way. It's usually just applying something to the skin or holding something under your tongue or holding something over, um, holding or like causing condensation to form on something and then licking it off of the crystal or whatever. Um, you know, it's not anything along the lines of, you know, oh, in just this, in just this substance, uh, some of the stuff that she lists doesn't exist anymore, sadly, but um, the stones do. Um, let's see. Let's see if there's anything else that I missed here. Yeah, yeah. So the the works the works of the saints are magical formulas. The novenas that saints have composed are Tumbergian magical formula. Um, yeah, there's plenty there, there, there's plenty, um, within scripture, within the lives of the saints, within the writings of the saints, as it pertains to acts of personal devotion. I mean, there's even descriptions of St. Dominic and the different postures that he would make, um, and the, how and what they correspond with, what virtues they espouse, and you know, act, um, I've heard someone say that uh, the the things that Saint Dominic was doing when he would pray is like Christian yoga, um, which uh, it's that's a bit of a stretch, at least for me. But if you if you take the time and you look. You know, kneeling, lying prostrate, holding your arms out as if you're crucified. Um, you know, we get those from the writings of the saints. Um, praying the rosary, using the prayer rope, recitation of the Jesus prayer or the prayer of the heart. All of these things have are, you know, it's not like a, it's not a formula in the sense that you do them and thus the effect is going to happen, uh, for your immediate gratification. You know, that, that is not the attitude that we have to have about these things, but for sure they are formulas in the sense of this is, well, let's just call it rubrics. You know, we'll call it rubrics instead of formula. And I would imagine Tomberg probably would agree with that as a synonym for what he means by formula. And we have to remember too, Meditations on the Tarot is not written for the uh, dyed in the wool Catholic. Meditations on the Tarot is predominantly written for the world outside of the church, especially the people who have gotten caught up in the occult. It's written for them primarily in order for them to come into, uh, to come to understand the truths of the Catholic faith. And so that they can recognize that the things that they're actually looking for can be found in the church and he provides them the means with which to achieve that a little backstory about me 
there was a point in time I had a crisis of faith and it started off with, uh, I would call it agnosticism. And then eventually it made its way to, uh, Buddhism. I became enthralled with Zen Buddhism, um, mainly because it, uh, um, Zen is purported more as a philosophy with ritualistic con with ritualistic practices that aren't designed for the purposes of worship. Um, but as veneration of the, um, of the teachers and Roshi's, preceding the uh, current Roshis going all the way back to the Buddha. So they, you know, it has its lineage, like the bishops have their linear, their lineage back to the original 12 apostles. Um, and then somehow from Zen Buddhism, I began, uh, I began exploring the occult. I never did get around to doing anything ritualistic. Um, I kind of was in more of the research phase before committing to anything. And that is when I came across two books, the magic of Catholicism by brother Ada or Augustino Tomaturgo and meditations on the tarot by Valentin Tomberg. And how I made it to Tomberg was through watching um, the chair, uh, uh, watching and listening to Roger Buck's YouTube channel, where he talks about his journey to Catholicism from the New Age and just the amount of reverence that he has and the love he has for Tomberg is incredibly endearing. And I thought it was rather interesting, you know, Tomberg, esoteric Catholicism. What is this? Why didn't I know about this? And so I had bought a copy of meditations on the tarot. It took me two years to read it the first time around. And since then I kind of dive in and read a random chapter here and there or reread a chapter here and there every once in a while, just to kind of stay relatively abreast on it. And I honestly have to say between Tomberg and Tomaturgo, uh, I, I owe them, uh, immense gratitude and I owe the good Lord gratitude is uh, first and foremost for having these books cross my path, uh, because they helped, uh, they helped bring me back to the church, um, for sure and helped me to glean a completely new appreciation for Catholicism that I never thought I had before. Um, learning, just le learning how truly deep, uh, how, how truly deep uh, the, the faith really is. Um, even from a standpoint that many would run from, um, as expounded by Tomberg in Meditations on the Tarot. So for sure, if you're already Catholic and you go into Meditations on the Tarot, just understand that he's writing predominantly to esotericists in, lay, in a language that they understand and often will provide new definitions to words that they are familiar with um, in order to hopefully bring about their conversion. But at the same time, he's for those of us who are Catholic that read the book, he opens us up to an aspect of the faith that I don't think many people today in modern times have considered. And as he argues periodically throughout this magnum opus of his, to forget that, to forget 
the depths, to forget the breadth, to forget the esoteric side of Catholicism. And again, we're not speaking in terms of an inner school of elites that think they're the only ones going to heaven. No, we're, uh, and we're also not talking about, oh, this is own, this is a set of ideas and practices only reserved for but a few. Uh, no, that, that's also not what we're talking about here. It's not what Tom Berg is talking about at all. He's referring to a part of Catholicism that is incredibly deep. This is why he uses the um, this is why he uses the analogy of the horizontal and the vertical. You know, in order for the church to be whole, it has to have both. And he often criticize he he criticizes um, in other works, sort of in a sideways fashion, um, modern Catholicism and the Second Vatican Council for um, f for disrupting the horizontal's connection to the vertical. Um, he, he criticizes how the Catholic Church has become more horizontal, more worldly, more materialistic. Um, and we, we certainly see that today with uh, the current pontiff, for sure. Um, you know, he's just embracing all kinds of worldliness beyond, uh, beyond anything that uh, people of the past few generations have seen. Um, you know, we haven't seen this bad of Pope, this bad of um, a pontificate in quite a while. Um, so, you know, he's... So yes, he, he's criticizing this, this sort of cutting off of the vertical and going horizontal with the Catholic church. And he, and part of meditations on the tarot is a warning about what is going to happen if we don't reintroduce the vertical, because so long as you have no verticality, you have no depth, you have no connection to what keeps it all going. You have no connection to the source of all being. Um, and I do believe that Meditations on the Tarot offers some hidden practical advice. It's a dense book to get through as Mr. Buck often points out in his videos about Tomberg meditations is like a thousand books in one. Um, it's like the, it's like a Christopher Nolan movie, um, where the editing, <laughs> the editing is all mishmashed in, in order to turn it into a puzzle. Um, and so, you know, in a way you could look at that as sort of, um, it, that's the path to initiation into Christian hermeticism <laughs> is, you know, that, that could, that could be it. That's how that could be. How, although he says there, there is no initiation into Christian hermeticism. Um, but uh, just for tongue in cheek purposes, it's almost like the book is a puzzle as well as spiritually uplifting and piecing the, the puzzle together is, um, it's, it's, it's gratifying, but it, it, it feeds the soul for sure. Uh, not, not the way that the sac, the, uh, not the way that the Eucharist feeds the soul, but, um, I would say probably a, cl a close third, yeah, close third for sure. The second being confession. Well, actually let's put the sacraments of, uh, Eucharist and confession on the same level and call piecing Tomberg's puzzle a uh, close second. And I think at this point I may have gone on too long. I hope that that has helped answer your questions viewer who um, commented on my one video. And if you want to ask any clarifying questions to provide me with more opportunities to provide content for all of you, for all 265 of you, again, thank you all, then um, please feel free to put it down in the comment section. And I will hopefully
be able to get back to making more of these videos. Right now, I am uh, doing some research on the I Ching. Um, while, um, and not gonna lie, the only reason that I started researching about the I Ching is because I started reading The Man in the High Castle. And it's a fascinating book. And I remember reading about the I Ching in the past. Uh, my father has a, has had a copy of it ever since I was a little kid. Uh, but I can't say I've ever seen him pull it out. He always had it on the... Um, he always had Sun Tzu's Art of War right next to it on the same shelf. <clears throat> and I remember one year pulling it out and kind of flipping through it and being kind of uh, curious about it. Um, it's almost like the Eastern version of the tarot. But there's... There's interestingly some, there's, there's definitely an air of astrology to it. Uh, there's, uh, there's something about the maths of it all and the, um, and the symbolism, um, that, uh, sounds interesting. And so I've been, I've been researching into the I Ching and reading, uh, Benabel Wen's, um, exhaustive uh, study of it and helping to kind of bring the reader into a better understanding of the cultural uh, heritage that lies beneath the I Ching. And of course, the purpose of doing this is to find the bits of the, to find the good seeds and saplings so that we can save them from the thistles and thorns um, and place them back into the good soil where they belong. Um, because like with the, um, the flower world prophecies of the Aztecs and how Our Lady of Guadalupe fulfilled those prophecies, those pagan prophecies, um, I want to investigate uh, whether or not there might be something to the I Ching, um, especially since the I Ching has more of a philosophical bent than a divinatory bent from what I can glean, although it certainly has been used in a more divinatory way for sure. Um, but yeah, uh, that's uh, that's currently what I'm kind of reading through. And Made in the High Castle is a phenomenal read, by the way. Um, I am, um, I think Amazon did themselves a disservice by adapting it because there is so much to the world building, especially that they chose not to include in the show. But anyhow, um, I hope. I've been able to answer your question, uh, all your questions, dear viewer. And if so, please let me know. Let's have a discussion. I'd be, um, I, I'm almost starving to have more conversations. I've been inundated with, uh, fundamentalist, uh, fundamentalist Protestants as of late and having to with uh, having to withstand the inc the approach of the uh, KJV onlyists, um, so please pray for me. I know they mean well, and I and I love them, and I love their zeal and everything. But um, yeah, that'll uh, not a conversation that I <laughs> that I want to have right now. So. Again, if you um, enjoyed this exegesis, it's a rambling. This is this is all just a rambling. But if you enjoyed it, then please make sure to like and share. And if you haven't subscribed yet, please, uh, I wish you would consider doing so. Um, I'm humbled that 265 people have subscribed to me. And so many uh and many of them that have pushed me over the 250 mark have come on 
uh, over the past few months that I haven't even been producing any content. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you all so much. Um, I'm, I'm happy to, I'm happy to hear that there are those of you who feel that the things that I share resonate with you. But again, just remember, this is meant to be a video journal. You know, I'm not in this to get monetized. I'm, I'm not in this to, uh, to garner any clout. Uh, I'm not trying to do this for academic purposes. I'm just on a journey. And if there's someone that finds help in seeing someone else go on a similar journey, then so be it. Uh, but um, it's mostly posterity for myself so that I can get my ideas out without having, uh, whenever I don't have the time to sit down and, um, and write it out by hand. So thank you all, and we will close with prayer. In the name of the et Filii, et Spiritus Sancti, Amen. Ave Maria, gratia plena, Dominus tecum, benedicta tu in mulieribus, et benedictus fructus ventris tui, Jesus. Sancta Maria, Mater Dei, ora pro nobis peccatoribus, nunc et in hora mortis nostrae. Amen.